Great takeaway is from Atlanta United season ending one no loss to Orlando City in the Eastern Conference semifinals of the MLS Cup playoffs. Sitting here with Tyler, who's at the game, and Henry. Guys, that's the old thing goes all good things must come to an end. And that was the case for Atlanta United this evening at Interco Stadium. Atlanta United just unable to find the final ball of the match. In the interest of full transparency, I was able to watch. I've been on the road all day, but I was listening to it, and it sounds like there are just these half chances, half chances, half chances all the way throughout the match, and Atlanta United were never able to really connect the dots and get that final ball in and ultimately challenge. Credo Gallese, who Tyler and Henry corrected me if I'm wrong, but he was not credited with the save, or if he was, it was one save. But um, that kind of was the story from this this evening, this afternoon, and ultimately it ends at Lenny United's three playoff run, Tyler. The thing is, he didn't have much to do, right? Pedro Galese just kind of was able to hang back. He wasn't really put under much pressure, and that's kind of the story of the game. The issues with, you know, Jamal Tagare and, and the injury and kind of like, do you keep him on? Do you take him off? It's a tough decision. And then, I mean, a lot of it just comes down to just poor luck. It finally seems like the bad luck caught back up with Atlanta. But yeah. it would be one thing if that was it, right? But then <laughs> the, the clock literally started. Orlando kicks the ball, and it drills Daniel Rios in the face and gives him a concussion. Like, you can't yeah. make it up, right? It's just – Yeah, it's just pure, pure unluckiness. And that's not the whole story. But, you know, your, your other guys have to be involved. They have to get – uh, on the ball, they have to create chances, and they kind of grew into it a little bit as the game progressed and near the end when things really started to open up because they're chasing a goal and they're, they're getting numbers forward. But it was just, uh, I think, a little bit of a coming back down to earth moment. It's frustrating. You can't you can't win a soccer game unless you at least put some shots on goal, and that just wasn't happening. Yeah, I mean, when you finish a game without any shots on goal, uh, yeah, it's it's not good. Uh, and when you lose both of the strikers that you brought into the game, it's also not good. Uh, yeah, I just kind of a little bit of tough luck, and also Orlando's just kind of a better team at the moment. Uh, and that's just kind of what it boils down to. Uh, yeah, the, the formation was a bit of a surprise to me because both times that they played Orlando this season, they went with the four back, uh, and putting Saba on the right as right wing back I think kind of limited him uh because he was starting from way deep and what you wanted to do is is run in behind and you know be in the final third uh and he kind of struggled to do that in the first half at least until Ronald Hernandez had to come on um and he was then you know pushed a little bit forward but yeah I, I think overall the game it, it was Orlando dominating and Orlando deservedly winning yeah. even though it was it was very close and it came down to that. And you know what? It, it's a set piece. And how many set piece goals has Atlanta United given up throughout the season? Uh, so just, I mean, what a way to end it. Unfortunate that it had to be, you know, to a rival. Uh, and unfortunate that you were a step away from getting to the conference final. Uh, and we talked about it before, you know, losing the momentum after an international break, losing the momentum after a big win, uh, and so it, I guess this this game kind of defines the season, kind of summarizes the season in a sense. But you know what? You kind of got to be proud of, of the group for putting together what they did dur during this playoff run and for giving the fans at least a little bit of joy of, you know, taking Messi out of the playoffs. That was – that's still something. And, hey, now you have an off season to look forward to where there's going to be a, a lot of stuff happening, and we'll talk about that. Uh, in just a sec. Takeaway number two, uh, the injuries to both strikers uh, that Atlanta United brought into this game. He started the game with Jamal Tiare, kind of the middle of the, of the first half, uh, goes down in a tackle, tries to carry on, and then, you know, he kind of goes down, kind of tries to get back up, and then he goes down again, and then, you know, at the end of the first half, that's where he just definitely cannot continue. Uh, Daniel Rios comes on, and then to start the second half, literally the kickoff is into Rios's face, and he goes down. Um, I don't know, Tyler, if you can confirm what happened, but it looks like it's a concussion. Uh, and, you know, that takes Rios out of the game, and so you're playing the rest of the second half without a true number nine, uh, and you're just kind of 
Ronald Hernandez came in. He took over the right wing back position. And then Saba was pushed up to make that front two with Alexi Moranchuk. And, you know, you end the game without a shot on goal. So, Tyler, take us into things. Yeah. Um, I kind of alluded to it earlier. As far as, like, what the, the prognosis is, you know, I, I think with the way it went down, you could assume that it was an actual concussion. Rob also, in the in the post-match press conference, he said, uh, in, in terms of just general speaking, he said, you know, and then Daniel Rios gets hit with the ball and, and has a concussion. That's not to say the official prognosis is he has a concussion, but, I mean, I think everybody can assume. Of course, that's why it was taken off. We know that. It was a concussion sub. Um, and then Rob also said he didn't have a lot of time to get involved and, like, implement himself into the game, right? I mean, he comes on at the end of the first half and then, like, literally – on the kickoff gets drilled in the face. So he had no time to, to do much. And then that leaves you, like you said, without a true number nine, which is not the worst thing in the world. Um, but this team has to have a consistent goal scorer. And, you know, Saba is the guy. I mean, if you're going to put anybody up there, it has to be Saba. You can maybe roll the dice with Tyler Wolf and put him up there and let, you know, maybe him hit on a counter as well. Um, but it, it, it really came down to going down a goal. That It always made this game much more difficult because you didn't have Jamal Tiare. Um, it's just an unfortunate turn of events, right? It's not like Orlando played Atlanta off the pitch. I mean, the goal that they scored, it wasn't a good goal. It just it, it hit off of Steon Gregerson's chest, kind of poked around in the box, and uh, I think it was Enrique is just able to poke a foot on it. Um, but again, on the other end of the ball, you have to go score goals. And... It's always going to hurt not having a number nine, much less two number nines. So it is what it is. But at some point, you know, you kind of have to look at it as at least it didn't come crashing back down in the worst possible way. Like I said, Atlanta didn't get played off the pitch. Dax said it in the press conference. Uh, Orlando was the better team on the day to a degree. And, and it is what it is. That's the playoffs. Yeah. A lot of Atlanta's game plan going into this was – having Jamal Tiare as someone who could sort of run off the ball and, and get to those uh, movements in transition. Like, you know, you have Pedro Amador playing the crosses and Tiare is supposed to be the guy that runs in and heads those in. Uh, and he was the guy that scored two goals in game three against Miami. He's obviously key to what this team's trying to do. So you take him out of the equation and it, it caused Atlanta th those problems that he couldn't get the shots on goal, just couldn't make anything happen. Uh, so yeah, it's just, it's real unfortunate. Uh, talking about Alexi Moranchuk and, and Saba, I think those are two players that can be very good when surrounded with very good players. Uh, when you had Gigi, Saba was very effective because the two knew how to really, you know, combine in a sense. Saba knew where to find Gigi. Uh, they kind of knew how to play off each other in a sense. And, you know, that connection's gone now. Uh, with Alexi, you haven't really seen him with any other, I, I don't want to say like good player, but you haven't seen him with a, a, a DP caliber player. He's the only one on the roster right now. So it's, it's going to be interesting to see what 2025 looks like with Moranchuk, with Saba, with these folks. Uh, and whoever else is brought in. Of course, that is leading into our third takeaway, which is the huge offseason that Atlanta United has ahead. Uh, so first of all, obviously, they have a, a head coaching decision to make. Are you going to keep Rob, uh, or are you going to look elsewhere? Uh, Jim Curtin is available now. You might give him a call. Patrick Vieira is off the table. That's a decision that has to be made. Also, your technical director position, long rumored to be Chris Henderson, but we still don't really have any confirmation there. I'd expect both of those moves, the coach and technical director, to be made soon because on top of that, you have a ton of roster decisions to make. So this Wednesday, November 27th at 1 p.m., that's the deadline for teams to make their final roster decisions. So basically decide whose options are you taking, whose loans are you buying, that affects, uh, I believe, like 10 players on Atlanta United's roster right now, uh, including Brad Guzan, Ronald Hernandez, some of those guys. Uh, we'll probably talk a little bit about those decisions on 
when the, Wednesday's show. No, we'll talk a lot about those decisions on Wednesday's show because that's when they're going to be made. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, but you also have several other dates. The expansion draft on December 11th. Uh, pretty sure some Atlanta United players are going to be el- eligible for that one, uh, giving San Diego some firepower, maybe. I don't know. Free agency opens on December 12th at 1 p.m. Uh, Atlanta has gotten some good players from that over the years. I believe you know Dax came in as a free agent, if I'm not mistaken. Um, then the re-entry draft, December 13th and 19th. That's where Derek. Atlanta got Derek Williams. Yep. Oh, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, and so you, I, I haven't seen the list of re-entry eligible players that because that comes out after decisions are made, but could be some interesting uh players there too i'm sure we'll probably do something on on that and then the mls super draft on december 20th uh which atlanta regular season finished like 20th in the supporters shield i think so they'll actually have a pretty decent pick this time around and we'll see how that goes um but yeah a lot of decisions to be made this offseason a lot of uh, new faces potentially for 2025 and a lot of uh, familiar faces that will be leaving. Tyler, what do you think of the massive off season that Atlanta United has ahead of it? I think, and and I, I was talking, I've said this before on our show, I've written it in, in our, uh, on, on scribesandspikes.com, talking with Doug today, he just kind of small talk off the side. This is the biggest off season Atlanta United has ever had um, by far just because of the, the sheer amount of room you have to work with, right? You have, like you said, the, the technical director, potential head coaching job, uh, two DPs, you 22s that are coming open, right? And then that's not to mention all the other roster slots that you could lose, whether you you know don't pick up options, whatever. There's a lot of room to work with. So um, Brad mentioned in the, the press conference, he said, I, I want to keep playing. I want to keep playing. And uh, kind of hard to turn him down after – how big, I mean, how, he had a phenomenal series against Miami, but he came up big tonight as well. He kept this game from, from becoming a blowout. Um, maybe not to the degree that we've saw, we, we saw in the Miami matches um, or even Montreal and before that, but you saw like vintage Brad Guzan. And it's not a knock against Josh Cohen or anybody else in the pipeline, but I mean, you, you got to milk that for all it's worth. You've got one of the best goalkeepers, at least veteran goalkeepers in the league, that brings a ton of experience. You're losing Dax McCarty, so you're losing another veteran presence in the, in the locker room. You don't want to lose too much. So um, there's there's a there's a lot of work to be done. Obviously, there's there's tons of tons of decisions to be made. Um, but Brad also said, you know, kind of what you what you noted, this locker room is going to look massively different in preseason 2025 compared to what it looks like right now. Um, I pointed out, you know, the big one obviously is Dax and uh, got to just a quick side note. You got to give Dax a massive round of applause. He's had a legendary MLS career just in general. Um, it was cool. And I know he, he said bittersweet a million times. It was cool. I, I saw him just a minute ago. He was leaving. Um, I, I think he's staying here with family for a while. I don't, I don't, think he's taking the, the plane back home as we saw last time when uh when he took he took the, the commuter flight back back to Atlanta. Um but he's done, you know? And it's it'll be really interesting to see what he has coming up. Um it's always fun to keep track of players as they move on, but especially retired players. You want to see kind of what they do. But um it's a big off season man. There's really no easy way to put it. It's the biggest off season that Landing Young's had. And just like LA Galaxy last year you could be going into 2025 with a a massive, massive upgrade at a lot of positions, and that could completely make next year um, entirely different than what we saw in the regular season this year. Yeah, you have a lot of work to do. Uh, looking at the 11, and then looking at the players that that come after your depth, um, and in theory, this is like a, a. I know Garth has been here for two years now, but it's like a completely new regime at this point because you're starting over with a new technical director. You're starting over with a new head coach handpicked, both handpicked at this point by Garth. Um, And then you have Arthur Blank's checkbook, which always kind of comes in clutch. You know what I'm saying? Uh, So big time. 
it's going to be, it's going to be interesting to see what happens and, and who gets brought in. Um, but yeah, it's going to be definitely a different team and hopefully, you know, just a more competitive one. It's a huge off season and we're excited here at Scarves and Spikes. You know, we're going to bring you all that information, all that coverage. Uh, so make sure you follow us on socials here. That's going to be a fun off season. So yep. Tyler, any last words? Make sure you guys keep an eye on scarvesandspikes.com. Like Henry said, tomorrow, Monday, maybe today when you watch this video, uh, we'll have our MLS Monday show because we're still doing that all the way through MLS Cup. And as always, we'll be doing our normal Wednesday show. It may just be me and Henry, possibly. <laughs> um, I don't know. It, it, it's Thanksgiving, so happy Thanksgiving, everybody, if you if you don't catch us on Wednesday. But we'll have a lot of news to talk about on Wednesday regardless. So uh, keep it on the socials, keep it on the website, keep it on the YouTube. All right. And we'll Tyler and I signing off for our final three takeaways of 2024. This has been See Real, y'all. See you guys.